So please welcome Costas. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. It's my first PyCon ever. Uh, and um, I'm going to start the talk, uh, which is called Going Global with Python. And uh, this talk is actually about localization, which you might have heard before. Uh, but uh, it could also be called globalization. And um, I want to uh, explain a bit about that at the end, if I have time. But I'll get into it right now. Um, first, uh, uh, I'm a Python engineer like you. Um, I'm from Athens, Greece. Uh, and I work at a company that uh, uh, provides serv localization services. It's called Transifex. Um, I'll mention th some things about Transfix in the talk because uh, we faced lots of uh, challenges ourselves when we tried to build our, our service related to localization. So um, now that I introduced myself, I'd like to uh, maybe ask a few questions to you uh, to know about, like, have a show of hands about how many people know what localization is. Say, so, yeah, cool. And how many of you have actually uh, done localization? Okay, fair, fair enough. Uh, fair enough number of people. Um, and now, uh, one more question. Vivi pred pred So, govoju ja ruskom jazdike. No? Probably no one because I, I messed it up, but um, it's uh, this is related to what I want to tell tell you next, uh, which is uh, okay. Sorry, uh, mistake. Uh, I'm going to tell you why it's important later. So this is the outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to first explain why we should care about it. You, you guys probably already care about this thing, as it seems. So I'm going to skip through that maybe, or be very quick with it. I'll explain some of the difficulties that it presents. Then I'll go into um, ways that you can be really good at it and uh, win uh, through localization. And at the end, I'll just mention a few things that I think are coming up next in, the, in localization that are not quite here yet, but I think we're going to be important in the future. So it's important, as you know, because a lot of people in the world don't speak English. Uh, actually, eight people in, out of ten do not understand English at all. Uh, and we are programmers, so why do we care? Uh, uh, but there are many reasons, and I'm just going to give you three. Uh, first of all, if you like open source, um, open source is great, and it's great for many reasons, but one of the reasons it's great is because it's actually pretty well localized. People all, all around the world, including myself, first started uh, their uh, trip into the open source uh, into open source development by contributing translations. Um, so many countries in the world uh, who were forgotten in the early days of computing uh, turned to the free and open source software because of localization. Um, Transifex, where I work, uh, is a case in point. We started as an open source project for Fedora Linux to localize Linux, Fedora Linux in, in this case. And it turned out to be um, much more than that for us, but uh, this is what it was in the beginning, just scratching our itch. Uh, so another reason is that with localization, you can go global, as we say. Uh, you, can, uh, you can speak, and your software can be used by people around the world. Um, so just because in the same way that people can't use uh, software that they don't understand if you want your software to be used you need to be understood and um, you guys know these logos i assume or at least some of them you know these are really big really big services that uh speak the the language of their users very well so baidu in china wechat in china uh, yandex we contact it. um and it's not only you know, con uh, companies and uh, products that mainly focus in a certain geographic areas, even international companies, uh, can only grow if they are localized. 
So for example, uh, Facebook didn't really start to grow the way it's growing until it uh, became totally multilingual and localized. Uh, this is a quote by, you know, the, the dog's mouth, as they say, the horse's mouth, as they say, um, which is not localized for this audience as a phrase, I, I understand, sorry. Uh, and now I'm going to come to the last reason that I think it's very important, um, and maybe the most important for me, because like you, I, I make software and applications, and I care about how they're designed, if they're well designed. So it turns out that localization is just another part of design. So when you design software, uh, localization is part of that. And actually, it's a, not any kind of design. It's uh, user experience design. It's, it's a trend, but uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, more than a trend. It's you know, caring about your users' experience when they use your app. So we should think of localization as, in my mind, another part of UX design. Um, but I don't know about you. I mean, I've worked uh, for some you know, uh, small startups. I've worked for some bigger companies. And everyone seems to care about UX, but not a lot of people think about localization until after. They don't start from the beginning uh, designing their software in, with this in mind. Uh, okay, it makes sense sometimes when you're small. Uh, but uh, if you're planning on growing, you should really uh, take it into account from the beginning, I think. I mean, how many of you have been in, in, a, in a meeting where the design team proposes to change you know the color of a little button and they and it's a big it's a big deal that what color this little button's going to be and there's like a b testing done in months of debates and whatever uh, like a checkout button and and then the users come and they don't really know what the button actually says so they, they don't click it it's not gonna it doesn't make sense to focus that much on just design graphic design and not focus on language, you know, the language that you're going to use to express some things. So uh, I don't think everyone uh, totally ignores this fact. I just think that maybe one of the reasons that people don't deal early enough in localization is because it's actually kind of hard. It's, it's, not as, uh, it's not really intuitive unless you've been through it, but it's actually really hard. Um, you know the phrase, um, there are two hard things in computer science. Have you heard of this uh, adage? So um, it's, there are two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. But uh, I would like to say in different languages, that's the hardest. <laughs> so why is it hard? Um, it's hard because languages are complicated. You know, uh, English is pretty simple, uh, but then you, know, you have Greek, which I speak and it's a bit more complicated. Russian is a bit more complicated, you know, uh, I think, I heard. <laughs> uh, and there are various, um, various reasons for that. Uh, so, plurals, uh, oh, sorry, that sounds weird here. Plurals are very complicated. Um, you know, uh, in English it's just uh, really simple. All the, the word is the same. One dog, uh, uh, and then, okay, two dogs. It's not that difficult. But other languages have maybe four, uh, five different rules. So it's another way of saying one dog, another way of saying two dogs, and then zero dogs is different. I don't know if Russian is one of these. But um, the, there's a resource that if, when I upload the slides, you can click CLDR. It's a common uh, language uh, data repository, I think. And they got like around 500 languages all cataloged about their little details. And it's just fun to go through and, and realize how many, how diverse human language is, I think. Um, so yeah, plurals. Uh, gender. Um, this is an example for, from Greek. Uh, in, in, in English, uh, a blonde is a blonde. It doesn't matter if it's a male or a female. In Greek, uh, you can have three different genders. The last one is, you know, for uh, like a dog, which we don't know if it's a female or a male. Um, then there are, th you know, differences in writing. Like um, you have uh, different numbers, uh, different ways of sorting, 
um, different writing direction. You know how in Hebrew, in Arabic, people don't write right, uh, left to right. They write right to left. And that's not all. There are some people in the world still today that uh, write alternating directions like this. It's called uh, boosterophodon. It's um, the way the, a cow would walk around a field. It's true. Check it out. Uh, so language is complicated by itself. And um, then there's all these other complications about politics and culture, uh, which uh, I'm not going to go into very much. But um, I'm just going to you know, give an, one example how one thing in one, in one, la in one country can be can mean one thing, and in the same country, in another country that speaks the same language, it can mean a different, a different thing. Uh, so in the US, in the UK, if you wear a sweater, that means you're American, because it's a sweater. If you're, if you're in England, it's a, it's a jumper. So that's, uh, there are lo lots of other examples like this, but uh, we don't have that much time, so I'm going to go down the way to talk about the conclusion of how complicated the language is, which is that we have to do a lot of work to handle all the different cases. And um, the communication involved is also a problem. So it's not just us developers, you know, translators have to do the work of the translating because we don't speak all the languages. Uh, and um, also designers um, need to take these things into account. You know, it's different when writing is going to start from the right, so you don't want to put your sidebar on the left uh, if it doesn't make sense for, I don't know, Arabic. And so there's a lot of um, back and forth, and uh, I see this all the time that uh, it's a lot of uh, complexity for organizations, you know, just organizational complexity, not like technical stuff. Uh, but we can fix these things, and we can do that because we're really good technical people, we're nerds, and we can save this uh, situation. And we've already done a lot, and there's probably a lot more we can do. So, um, no despair. Uh, this is a Python conference, so we should uh, discuss Python localization. Uh, and I'm just going to go through some quick uh, examples. Uh, rather, I'm going to show you uh, some things that you probably already know, if you, because you all have a good idea about localization. It's some of the ways that you can translate strings uh, in your Django or Flask application. Um, so yeah, we have like a, a little view, a little view here from Flask or a template tag up there that would translate the phrase uh, into uh, the language of the viewer. Um, I won't bother you with this much more. I'm just going to um, tell you that, OK, you do all, we do all this. Uh, we, do all, we, do, we get all our strings. We extract strings from our source code. We create a file. We send it to the translators. We get a translation back. Um, and everything works uh, not really well sometimes because uh, <laughs> We don't really know what the translators have given us, uh, you know, and maybe even if it's um, even if it's not a machine translator, uh, sometimes things go wrong, and uh, it's not always our fault, but some but sometimes it's our fault. So what can we? How can we avoid some common errors when we're lo writing Python, uh, localizing localizing our Python app? This is coming up, so uh, I'm going to show you some common mistakes. Here we have uh, someone, Python coder, writing, creating a message that has a variable inside. And this thing is going to arrive at some translator who's going to think, was available, was unavailable. That's not, that's not an English sentence. I don't know what to do with that. Because he needs to see the whole thing. So you, know, uh, you want to include a placeholder there. Another problem would be you're uh, going to print an the amount of money that a product costs. And you know you want to get $9.99 here. But if you're in Canada, you need to actually show them that these are not dollars. These are US dollars. It's not only about language. It's about where you are. Canadians and, and Americans, they speak the same language. Uh, but um, you can get in trouble if you decide to charge someone $9.99, but he's from Canada. 
<sighs> Here's some other errors that have to do with um, uh, common things that we do in web apps. So here we have a view uh, class. This is, could be in Django, uh, could be in another framework. And uh, it's supposed to show an error, and the, we want that error to be uh, translated into our viewer's language. However, um, if you're familiar with GetText, uh, GetText will translate this immediately, as soon as you load this module. Uh, and so it's just going to be in English all the time. So uh, you need to use uh, a lazy version of GetText, which will only get translated uh, when the actual view is being rendered. Uh, here's another uh, problem that uh, commonly occurs. Um, you want you have an error, uh, and you want to log this to your f log file, but you also want to show it to the user. And uh, here it is. Uh, here's a really uh, naive approach because y in the end you're going to get uh, something in like I don't know uh, Arabic in your logs, and you're not going to know what that is. So you can get around that by using a version called a version of GetText called GetText No Op. Um, so, ah, one more. Uh, do you see the problem here? This is an English word uh, that has different meanings depending on the context. So, in the first, if you have this in like maybe two different source files, and you're going to be printing, uh, I don't know, what the Russian word for April is, I should have looked it up, but it's probably different than the the name, which is you know something else. <laughs> uh, so here's uh, how you get around this. Usually, uh, you use in Django's case, um, pika text. So you tell the translator, okay, I want actually April to be translated twice: once as a month name and once as a female name. Um, so, we wrote a Django app to provide translation services for Fedora in the beginning, and uh, we dealt with all these problems, and we came up, uh, we, we figured them out, and this actually informed us in the design of our service, so um, I would like to uh, be allowed to talk a bit about how how we do things uh, for ourselves. Um, so Transifex is a web web app. It's got a core translation memory system. It's got a lot of front-end stuff in JavaScript that I don't know about. Um, and we have all this pipeline that people, this developer pipeline that you know many of you uh, probably also are familiar with, where you got your source code management, pull requests, automated builds, deployment. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we're pretty, uh, pretty normal in this uh, in this respect. Um, so we use GetText. It's pretty boring, but that's that's what exists in Python. Uh, it's not. Um, we use GetText also in the front end, but uh, we have to do really some hacky stuff for this to for this to work. And I uh, I might go into it a bit later. And then for our deployments, we basically use our own service. We we dog food, uh, so we basically integrate everything. And I'm going to talk about how we do this later. Uh, we try to make it totally automated, to basically remove the possibility or reduce the possibility of errors. Um, yeah, this is uh, one of the hacks that we did to get uh, f uh, get text to work in the front end. It's it's uh, it's yucky. Don't don't look at it. Don't look at it. <laughs> so <laughs> the um, uh, the last thing that we uh, needed to do and we found out uh, was very important as you know in our development work is we needed to review all of the code that we wrote for possible localization errors and. Um, well, there are, you know, all these errors that I mentioned in the beginning, but uh, one of these things that's hard to find is what if you forget to mark something for translation? So you're writing your app and you just forget about it and you print a string without using the little 
parenthesis underscore in front. Um, and that, that gets uh, deployed and then some guy in, in Taiwan will see your English phrase and, and it won't look really nice. There, there's a solution for that and um, we, we use it ourselves. Um, oh yeah, uh, sorry. These are the, the mistakes that you could make. Uh, but for unmarked strings, here's the solution. Can you read what, what it says here? Yeah, it says pseudo localization. So we invent a new language uh, that doesn't exist. So we just replace all the characters in English with some letter that looks a bit like it, and you know, then we 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 up we deploy on our staging server, and someone goes through and immediately sees that that piece of text that was not marked for translation. It's really a lifesaver sometimes. Because you can't go, uh, you know, check uh, seven different languages to see if there's a mistake. You, you're gonna, you're gonna have to, um, you're gonna have a hard time. So this is how we built Transifix, and now we've seen all the needs that uh, we had and all the needs that our um, our users have, and we are. Um, we're basically uh, watching this industry and participating in this industry and seeing lots of innovations that I think are, uh, that I'd like to talk about that you can, uh, you can take advantage of in many ways, you know, either, either using our service or our other services or uh, open source uh, tools that exist. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about four things here that are new in localization, uh, relatively new. And uh, I think really change things to the better. Um, so, yeah, let me just get into it. So, continuous delivery and localization. Um, it's important because we're used to now, today a lot of people are used to deploying 10 times a day and everything. And, and that's amazing and, and I like that and I do that myself. But when you're deploying 10 times a day, it's really hard to get... To, um, for your translators to keep up, and it's hard for you to manage this whole process. So it's really important that everything gets automated. So um, this is an example of a workflow that is basically how we do it. Uh, and it goes like this. Uh, we have a continuous integration job like in Jenkins or some other tool that will run a script. It will get all of the strings from our source code and upload them to our translation management system. Uh, in this case, Transfix. Our translation management system automatically will send out notifications, ping all the translators that are required to translate these strings. It knows which ones are already translated, doesn't have to be told. Uh, and as soon as all, they, all the translators uh, do their job and we get to 100% again, uh, our translation management system will basically, uh, through a webhook, start a new continuous integration job which will download all the translations, uh, create this resource bundle, uh, depending on you know what technologies you're using, uh, and start a build to do the deployment. So it's, uh, it's almost as if uh, translations uh, are part of the whole uh, normal development cycle. It's not like a different thing. It's not a foreign thing that we have to stop developing. Uh, we have to don't stop making changes, freeze everything until our translators finish with their job. It's just continuously rolling all the time. Um, so this is one great thing and uh, there are actually lots of um, services that you can use uh, for uh, uh, getting access to translators that provide really fast translations. So, you know, they have people all around the, real, all around the world, uh, these providers of translation services, and they can, re they can really uh, help you out. The other thing that I'd like to talk about uh, that I, f I find very useful for translators, not so much for us, but it involves us, is uh, in-context translation. So instead of a translator just seeing a list of strings, um, today, it's possible in, in, to, uh, for the translator to do the translation while looking at the actual uh, application. 
So you got a login uh, form here, and the developer, us in this case, has marked uh, the translatable string on the screenshot. Or the OCR can also do this. Um, it doesn't OCR doesn't always work. Sometimes it needs to be manual, and the translator can you know um, be more confident about if doing that he's doing his job correctly. Uh, this also works for web applications, obviously. You know, you can just take a screenshot of your web page and that will do the same thing. Next, uh, next thing, because um, we're running out of time, sorry if I'm speeding, but uh, yeah, is uh, what we call localization delivery networks, which are like content delivery networks. You, do you all know what content delivery networks are? Yes. So. Imagine instead of just uh, getting your uh, static files, your images, your uh, CSS files uh, delivered to your users, you know, from like a CDN, you can also get the translations delivered from uh, from the CDN. So the user, when the user switch let switches languages, he doesn't have to uh, send a request to your server and load the whole page again. He can basically in page make make an AJAX call, bring the translations. Um, in some cases, you can even have your translators working, doing the translations in your web page. So they don't have to, you know, check out your source code or they don't have to log into any service. They just go to your web page. If you, you know, you, you add a few JavaScript files in the right location and they can, they don't have to do anything else. They can just click on the text and change it. Uh, so this is really helpful. Um, Here's a, an example from our service. It's like the PyCon uh, Belarus uh, website. Uh, and I've just translated it um, inside the web page. This is uh, in a browser. The screenshot is a bit small. But yeah. <sighs> so, OK, almost done. Um, all this already exists, but I think uh, Localization is a field that's growing fast, and companies uh, like ours are innovating. But also, you know, big companies like Google, um, uh, Dropbox, etc. They are uh, also innovating in this field because they realize how important it is. Um, so they're they're making their own TMSs, homegrown, so that that are sometimes, and they've open sourced some of these. So you know, if you don't uh, have the resources to pay for uh, uh, TMS, a proprietary TMS. There are some really good open source ones as well. Uh, and but there's some things that I think are going to probably happen in the near, in the near future that uh, are worth uh, that are worth talking about. So uh, one of the one of the issues that I still have that we still have um, is that okay we're Python programmers, but our applications usually have lots of different technologies in them, like, uh, you know, you've got, I don't know, uh, Node, cert Node microservices, you've got uh, your Django apps, you've got your front-end uh, code, like maybe in React, and all these things are very fragmented at the moment, and you need to do different um, hacky things to bring them all together, because, I mean, it's a bit too much to have to uh, run these builds, these translation builds, for each separate service you have. You want to integrate these things. So I think uh, we're going to see a uh, consolidation. And uh, that's not going to be a bad thing in my mind. Uh, currently, for example, uh, Java uh, and C++ are really kind of uh, going in another direction than where where they were uh, and where Python is right now. So I think. Uh, Python is going to move in that direction as well. And I'll show you what I mean. Uh, so this is an example from uh, the current uh, get text uh, situation where we want to print uh, a string, depend a different string depending on how many guests are, are invited to a party. And this is uh, actually quite good. Uh, this is how we do it today. But uh, in, in Java and in C++, they're doing something a bit better. And Python has still not caught up. I think, I think it should. Uh, 
This is uh, this is uh, an example from uh, from uh, ICU message format, which is like a format string, the kinds that we have in in Python, but it's a bit more intelligent. So um, here we can we can uh, based on the context change the gender. Uh, maybe it's a girl, so she invites a person to her party. Um, or maybe we don't know if she's a, uh, a girl or, or if he's a man, so it's ambiguous. We want to say something different. Um, because, uh, uh, I missed something, but yeah. Um, otherwise, we have to do these weird things. Uh, we have to say his slash her, or uh, invites uh, one people to his party. That, that's not, that sounds really weird in English. You say one person, there's n people is, you know, for the plural. Um, and uh, it looks complicated, but uh, you can send this to a translator, and the translator knows what to do. And he will, and your website will be speaking in a natural way, not in a, uh, you know, one uh, item parentheses s uh, or something, because you don't know if it's one or many. Um, and uh, the last but not least, uh, I think we're going to see much better machine translation uh, in the future. Currently, uh, machine translation is like a poor man's solution. You, don't know, you can't afford a translator. So what are you going to do? You're going to translate with uh, Google Translate. Um, but I think things are changing. Like Google already has a, um, has a translation option where it uses uh, neural networks, which is really cool. Um, and what I'm seeing, what, what I think is going to happen is we're going to get a, a, this, a combination of deep learning uh, from machines and also human supervision. So, uh, you know, the, um, at the moment, Google, can, Google is improving their translations, but doing so in a, one way for everyone. But what we see happening is that more personalized uh, things. So, you know, uh, your project tends to speak in a very informal manner, your, your, neural, your translation uh, machine is going to adapt to your style. So it's not going to just uh, speak in a very you know, general way. It's going to be more personalized. So um, that's all. Uh, thank you.